Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is our view from the North series uh, involving a, a kind of reflexive examination of American issues from Canada with our friend, Dr. Ken Rogers from Kelowna, British Columbia, uh, who um, is a retired Canadian businessman and who has advanced degrees in economics and business. I was there. I can vouch for him. Hi, Ken. Hello, Jay. So um, the reserve currency is our discussion today. And the reserve currency is, the, is an issue that popped out of the, all the um, argument controversy about the debt ceiling. Um, and it was raised because it, had the debt ceiling you know, not been raised, um, there are those opportunistic uh, geopolitical powers that would have looked to accelerate um, the decline of the American dollar as a reserve currency, the global reserve currency. Um, how great was that threat? Well, you have to get what is a reserve currency first to determine, you know, the effect on uh, of somebody not being happy with that or wanting to dislodge it as as the most dominant reserve currency in the world. But the idea of a reserve currency is is fairly simple. It's when one country wants to sell goods to another country. If you pick a, a small country like Costa Rica, uh, where they produce a lot of, um, oh, let's say, bananas, pineapple, and, and palm oil, uh, as well as have a lot of tourists, um, to them, a reserve currency is important because, you know, if they're going to sell their product to a company, uh, to a country like Canada, where the weather is very different, so we need fresh fruit in the winter. Uh, and so Canada basically pays the Costa Ricans in U.S. dollars. Um, you know, the, the basis of trade, especially oil, oil is the easiest example because the price of oil is around the world is always in U.S. dollars. Um, you know, you don't hear somebody say, you know, the barrel of oil per euro or per any other thing. It's always per U.S. dollar. Similarly, the price of gold. Now, if you um, um, uh, want to have a different currency, there's no great reason that you can't have a different currency trade. For example, the U.S. dollar uh, amounts to about 60% of the world's um, usage as a reserve currency. The euro covers about 20%. Well, now, you know, in the last couple of years, uh, most of the countries in Europe have adopted the euro internally. For example, France doesn't use, or a Frenchman doesn't uh, go to the grocery store and buy his groceries in French francs anymore. He goes to the grocery store and buys them in euros. So where the, that was not the case a couple of years ago, well, a couple of years ago, um, you know, if the French wanted to uh, do some uh, trading with Sweden, you know, they normally ended up uh, doing it in U.S. dollars. Now, the the fact that the U.S. dollar is the most common currency used for uh, transactions between countries, not just um, physical trade of physical goods, but also capital flows. Um, you know, if, um, you know, the Chinese wish to make an investment in Canada, uh, that investment, uh, you know, would end up uh, actually being in U.S. dollars. You know, the Chinese would change to U.S. dollars and then, you know, the uh, U.S. dollars would change to Canadian dollars in Canada. So the fact that the that the US dollar is dominant in all of these transactions uh, gives um, great prestige to the US. You know, the little country like 
Costa Rica or Canada compared to the U.S. economically. Um, it, it's very prestigious that, uh, you know, if, if you're in Costa Rica and most of your international transactions are in U.S. dollars, all the tourists come to town with U.S. dollars, um, you know, where tourism is their largest industry, really. Um, you know, a typical Costa Rican would think there is no country on earth as prestigious as or important as the U.S. You know, the, you know, they don't even know what the currency the Chinese use. What is it? Now, uh, <clears throat> you'd have great difficulty replacing the U.S. dollar uh, by anything currently, except perhaps the euro. The euro is getting closer. But um, one of the major reasons, for example, you couldn't uh, have the Chinese uh, currency become a reserve currency to the same degree is they have, they do not have a large capital market uh, where you know, large amounts of money can be exchanged quickly. You know, you can buy U.S. Treasury bills, uh, you know, uh, many, you could buy, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth, you know, in a few minutes. Um, and it would run, the transaction would be very smooth. You have a very efficient capital markets in New York City in particular. Um, and um, the world countries, most of them have a deposit at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in New York that operates almost like a, a bank for your, your transactions in Hawaii. Would um, You'd go to one of the local banks and, and your transactions would be handled and so when you buy the groceries, the grocery store, you know, would get their money via the bank. Well, the Federal Reserve acts almost like a banker for countries. Like Canada has a has U.S. dollars, so when it's buying the uh, uh, um, goods from Costa Rica, um, really all that happens is um, is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York shifts the uh, you know, the Costa Ricans now have more money and the Canadians have less U.S. dollars on deposit at the Fed of New York. Um, now, that uh, prestige factor um, is the most important one, where another major factor is the fact that, that um, countries, you know, let's call it the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, the U.S., the European Union, you know, all do most of their international transactions in either U.S. dollars or euros. Um, but but that, uh, the fact that it's um, respected in that regard, it, it facilitates extra trade if you have a smooth way of transacting and you don't have to worry about, you know, is is this currency any good? You know, if you're talking about China, you know, they have capital controls. And so on a minute's notice, suddenly you, you know, if you were dealing in the Chinese currency, it might get frozen or you know, it can't. You can't transact it. You can't use it. It's no good for anything else. You know, and if you took it to some other country, to Australia, they'd say we don't want that crap. You know, <laughs> is give us give us some good currency. You know, we'll take U.S. dollars. We we might consider you know some euros, but we'd be less happy with it, euros than we would U.S. dollars. Like it's like insurance and in trade, isn't it? I mean, in other words, if you're um, if if you're a a seller and you want to be very sure you get your money, uh, you want to have somebody guarantee stability of the currency um, and reliability of the of the transaction, and you're not necessarily you know uh, going to take uh, Peruvian Peruvian dollars, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> uh, you're, because you're not sure that it's going to work. But if the Fed gets involved in the middle, 
uh, then you have the full faith and credit of the United States uh, to guarantee that this that this will happen. You will get paid because if you get paid in dollars, you can rely on that. So um, what about Bretton Woods? This all happened at Bretton Woods after, which is, I think, New, New Hampshire, um, a meeting in Bretton Woods after World War II. Can you talk about that? Well, that was, you know, at the time the United Nations were formed and the equivalent of stuff, they, they wanted some stability in currency. And prior to World War II, the British pound had been the dominant reserve currency in the world. Um, you know, but Britain was blasted in the war. I mean, they were they were beaten to <laughs> beaten to the ground. And uh, and the US um, grew dramatically during the war and, and its dominance was was pretty obvious by the end of the war. Um, so that it was just agreed that uh, and at the time, the US dollar was pegged to gold. You know, so that gave an extra bit of insurance and certainty, um, you know, and it, that lasted until Richard Nixon, you know, took the United States dollar off the gold standard. And I would say, thank goodness, finally, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, because it was, it had a use uh, at the time of Bretton Woods and prior to that is is everybody felt at least there was something in common. You know, now, if you use reserve currency, for example, you could actually uh, use gold as a reserve currency if everybody wanted to trade it. Well, you know, you'd have, you could have, if if you trusted the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, they could have these big piles of gold, you know, the the one closest to the left wall might be Canada's pile, and the one in the, you know, third from the left might be the United Kingdom's. And when there's a transaction, they can just shift the gold from one pile to another instead of uh, the, um, you know, uh, uh, treasury bills or what they now shift from one pile to another. Well, so, you know, um, with all of that, the, the word reserves that takes on a special meaning. It's like uh, if you have the reserve currency, if the reserve currency is the currency of your country, it means you have reserves. Uh, you have more reserves than most other countries, maybe than all other countries. Uh, and th that doesn't mean gold anymore because Richard Nixon disconnected gold and the dollar. But it does mean reserve what does it mean in terms of reserve? What kind of reserves do you have to have to have what is known as the reserve currency? Well, in you you know most people's personal lives, they have they have a bank account, you know, and they have their personal you know standby. If they want to go to the grocery store, how do they pay? You know, if they want to buy a car, if they want to pay their rent. You know, they need to have their personal family reserves or their abilities to pay. So it's money in the bank. If essentially, it's money to handle international transactions. Mm. So now what we've heard in recent years, I mean, the U.S. history has been spotty since Bretton Woods, since the end of World War II, the greatest generation and all that since the economics of the 50s, I suppose, when we really felt our oats. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen um, uh, assassinations. We, we've seen a very regrettable war in Vietnam. Uh, we've seen, gee, a lot of strange things in politics and stranger yet right now, and, and the dysfunction of the Congress and the Supreme Court. He's a problematic, you know, the guy in who writes uh, in the Irish Times says that the U.S. deserves our pity. P-I-T-Y, that's what he says. And um, this is very troublesome because a lot of the reserve currency is a question of confidence in the country, that it will remain stable, reliable, um, that its institutions will be predictable, will not fail. And yet those questions during the Trump administration anyway have been raised, if not longer. 
And uh, so after a time, you have to think, hmm, uh, maybe we should not uh, assume that the United States will remain constant and reliable and predictable and so forth. And, and there are those, um, you know, predictors um, that are saying that, yeah, that's, that's true. And, and we have a slippage. We have a decline of world confidence so that there is a risk um, to the United States dollar staying as the reserve currency, including most recently Janet Yellen, who made a number of speeches over the past few weeks alerting us to the fact that we may not be able to hold on to it forever. So what's the status of that and the decline? Well, a few years ago, the United States dollar um, accounted for about 90% of the world's um, reserve currencies. And currently, it's at the lowest level it's been since Bretton Woods. Uh, you know, it's around 60%. Now, the euro is about 20%. So, you know, still, you know, you'd call it civilized <laughs> society accounts for that much. But but the um, facilitating trade between countries is an important item so that there are five countries called BRICS, B-R-I-C-K-S, and it was really Brazil, Russia, India, China, and oddly, South Africa. You know, it, South Africa is pretty tiny economically compared to the other four. The other four, you know, fit in the, you know, top 10 countries economically in the world. And, and you know, you can think of the Chinese, might, you know, if they want to do some trade with some country, you know, like Kenya or something in West, in East Africa, and it's in U.S. dollars. You know, that would be kind of embarrassing to the Chinese. That's kind of a prestige thing. But also, you know, the Chinese and the Kenyans need to have U.S. dollars. Well, if they don't do as much trading with the U.S. or or if you're like uh, China compared to, let's say, Vietnam, where, you know, there's the major trade for both countries is with with each other with china to vietnam and vice versa well why should they do it in us dollars you know it would work more efficiently for them if they could do it in their own currencies you know and that's the the brics countries thing is to facilitate additional trade between them um, and also to avoid some of the nasty things the U.S. does, like sanctions. It seemed to be an item that Congress really likes nowadays. And sanctions, the fact that the U.S. dollar is so dominant enables these sanctions to work. You know, if the U.S. dollar was not the reserve currency, then the Russians would not be suffering, nor the Iranians from U.S. sanctions. You know, the U.S. sanctions absolutely ruined Cuba. You know, Cuba was is a neat country. They have neat people, you know, but uh, the U.S., uh, the idiotic sanctions, in my opinion, imposed on Cuba have just decimated it financially. Well, you know, what I get out of that is that uh... It's not like the reserve currency gives you a percentage of the deal. No. It's not like you're going to get you know, anything out of that deal. You only get leverage, power, influence, as you say, prestige. Um, and so it's kind of very interesting that even in the, in the Kenya-Russia transaction you talked about a minute ago, um, well, up till now, they were probably using the dollar, even if Kenya doesn't have a lot of dollars. Um, and everybody would buy into the dollar because that was what people do. The shippers, right? The manufacturers, the, the whole economic framework of the deal in, involved mm, using the dollar. But now there comes a time when those things are simply not as persuasive. And if the United States prestige is less in other ways, then they're tempted, especially by organizations, uh, collaborations like the BRICS uh, group. Um, to use some other transaction 
There's something called LCT. You familiar with that? Local currency trading in a given uh, uh, region where they're already doing those kinds of things. I think BRICS is not really a region, but it's a, you know, it's a larger group of countries that have decided to try to sidestep the uh, American reserve currency. And I don't you think we're going to see more of that? Uh, we're, we're going to see that happening elsewhere. And we're going to see it led by China, who would love to see us lose the prestige. And Russia, of course, that has been uh, the object of our sanctions and would love to see anything bad happen to the United States. So these people are dedicated uh, to trying to topple us off, off the uh, reserve currency. How can they do that? Just ignore it, not trade in it, refuse to take dollars and, and look for other currencies to step in. I mean, even in the, BRIC, in the BRICS uh, organization, it's not like uh, Brazilian money is the reserve currency there. It's something else. I don't remember what it is. But they will pick another currency, any currency other than the dollar, and refer to that. So there's certain currencies that are emerging as the contenders, right? Well, if they do enough trade between, you know, certain countries, let, let's use Saudi Arabia and China, you know, since one could obviously think that uh, China buys a ton of oil, Saudi Arabia produces it, and on the other hand, uh, you know, the Saudis have a lot of money to spend, and so they could buy a lot of Chinese goods. Well, if the trade between them was sufficient, like if they encourage the trade between them, then they could deal in their local currencies. You know, they would be more acceptable. The, the risk to the Saudis that the Chinese uh, have a, a lousy capital market, you know, you can't, you know, move a billion dollars of Chinese remumbi or whatever it's called uh, e easily. Uh, yeah. But th but they could have the, uh, you know, transactions between them work quite efficiently. And when you think of, of Russia, China, and, and India, you know, they're, they're and, and Brazil, they're, all four of those countries are in the top dozen around the world in, in size, especially if you treated the euro as if it was one country rather than, you know, Germany and France, uh, uh, you know, being and Italy being sizable countries on their own. Um, so that that uh, ability to do trade just between a certain group of countries and deal in their currencies more easily is, is far more workable. You know, and, and capital investment can work that same way. You know, the, the you know, the Chinese like to, you know, their Belt and Road initiative is they want to invest all over the place, but that's because their their goods trade policy is always so uh, controlled that their exports far exceed their imports, so that in order that they don't have pressure with their currency going up, uh, you know, going up so high it spoils their exports that they you know look for a place to invest the capital that will be a good long term strategy uh <clears throat> but well, the, the long term you... strategy is to topple the US uh, and i guess these you know these regional arrangements or uh, collaborations between countries that uh, would like to trade in their own currency or in, in some currency other than the US uh are, will probably grow over time, don't you think? And as the U.S. Uh, demonstrates a, a lack of, um, uh, what do you call it, a lack of organization in Congress, a lack of uh, strong government, you know, historically, um, then we lose uh, the prestige and, and uh, they are more likely to do that. So what's the future? Well, uh, the future, I... It, for quite a while, the U.S. dollar will remain as the dominant reserve currency. You know, you have stupid things like the uh, Congress or the, you know, Republican side dealing with that debt ceiling limit. You know, like if the U.S. needs to get rid of that debt limit um, requirement, you know, of 
uh, Congress having to raise the debt limit since it's really they've already approved the bills. Why <laughs> why do they then decide we're not going to pay after the fact? Um, you know, it, it's it's just a stupid political stunt that that jeopardizes the reserve currency factor. Now, back to one point you made was uh, the U.S. Do U.S. does not get a fee every time somebody's using the U.S. dollar for transactions, but the U.S. does benefit. You know, for example, the U.S. can ran can run a budgetary deficit at Congress more easily than any other country because of the demand around the world for U.S. dollars. The fact that, that you know, the Costa Rican or, or the Kenyan, they need to buy U.S. Treasury bills uh, so they can have their trade transactions, you know, so that that tends to make U.S. monetary policy more flexible than any other country's monetary policy. You know, Canada, for example, when in the U.S. raises interest rates, you know, Canada pretty well is forced to follow mm -hmm. because otherwise the capital will flow from Canada to the U.S. You know, where right. interest rates are higher and people want to get a better yield and or they'll invest in the U U.S. stock market. You suggest, and, and that's exactly what um, Janet Yellen said, that this is a long, slow process, and it's not going to happen overnight, but it is in some ways inexorable, and that ultimately it will happen. I just wonder, you know, whether this is event-driven. In other words, suppose the U.S. does something really stupid, um and well you know, do that lots <laughs> <laughs> lately in particular i mean how can you have uh, two parties and one party is uh, they, their leaders a criminal <laughs> exactly this is not helping us this is no. not helping us reserve you know with the reserve currency or with american prestige but suppose we do suppose we elect trump again and he takes he takes steps that are, you know, adversarial uh, to Europe and uh, to, you know, global policy. Um, and, it's, you know, it's really intolerable because he doesn't care, but it's he said, intolerable. He, he gives uh, arms to Russia instead of Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, right. That kind of thing. Yeah. If that happens, if it's really gross like that, is it possible that Janet, Janet Yellen's prediction and your prediction of a slow, gradual decline in our ability to preserve the reserve, um, you know, will accelerate. Yeah, and we're, yes. we're, yeah. absolutely. Hmm. So, now, uh, go ahead. Oh, well, it was, it, it really, um, in many regards, you know, the reserve currency, I mean, it's not as if the U.S. will go bankrupt if it's, if the U.S. dollar is no longer the reserve currency, you know it. It's just a very prestigious thing that assists the U.S. to accomplish a bunch of its objectives. It'll just be less able to accomplish those objectives. Uh, you you know they have more trouble. Like the U.S. has a ridiculous negative balance of trade. You know, and you have a ongoing federal deficits. Well, if you're not the reserve currency, it'll be tougher to do both of those. You know, you'll need more financial discipline and more trade discipline or, you know, the U.S. dollar will go down in value, you know, so that, uh, uh, you know, it'll adversely affect uh, a lot of things in the U.S. Like it, at things you sell, you'll get less money for. Well, that that suggests that um, that if we were not the reserve currency, um, that we would have a more difficult time in managing um, our our trade relations, our fiscal policy at home, um, our our debt in general. Um, and you know, I remember that it, it was not not a long time ago, a few weeks ago, when we talked about the um, the, the resistance to 
uh, lifting the debt ceiling, um, that there were all these warnings that if we don't do that, all kinds of things would happen. And the, these things would affect the man in the street, the woman in the street, and that our quality of life, our quality of consumer life would change. And what, only one of those things was we might lose the reserve currency. But just taking it all by itself, Ken, just the reserve currency, if we lost that, how would it affect my life as a consumer? How would it affect our daily collective lives in the country? Um, how would we know that something bad had happened? Or would we be impervious to that? Uh, in between. That is, you, you really wouldn't have a major dramatic effect on an individual living in Hawaii or Montana or, or Colorado kind of thing. Um, if you were a, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan bank, you know, the biggest bank in the world, you know, you would know the difference <laughs> um, because you'd have, you know, um, your quantity of financial transactions would be diminished greatly. You know, the, the U.S. Um, annual gross domestic product is around $25 trillion, where there's about $7 trillion in these international reserves you know, just in, in U.S. dollars. Um, so that, uh, you know, that, you know, amount of that, how many treasury bills does the rest of the world own? Well, you know, if those suddenly aren't there, you know, the U.S. federal government has a problem, you know, like with their debt, you know. Um, no, it won't happen quickly, though. You know, like you get even even Trump, you know, as much as Europe uh, shuddered when, you know, with Trump's, uh, you know, pro-Russian <laughs> kind of policies, um, anti-everybody else, uh, uh, that, that really played a role in reducing the um, status of the U.S. dollar as reserve currency. That's why it's only 60% now, you know, and it wasn't very long ago. It was, you know, well over 80%. Um, <clears throat> however, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a sure death for the U S that the dollar would not be the same, but then, you know, you know, if you think of all the political speeches of the U S is, you know, you know, we are the world leader, we are the biggest and best and strongest and so on. Well, that just won't be so anymore. Uh, you know, one thing that strikes me, and maybe this is, let me, let me pose this to you and see what you, you think. If I find one day that the U.S. is no longer the reserve currency, it goes from 60 to 50 to 40, yeah. and uh, the RMB or the ruble or or the pound, or the euro, uh, have become, you know, the majority of the world currency. It's kind of a canary in the coal mine, isn't it? In other words, it, it's not by itself. It's not, a, you, you know, a, a single factor kind of way of a metric. Uh, it, it really reflects that other things have happened. Other things have caused us to lose ground on the amount of our reserves and our reserve currency. And therefore, if I find one day that the uh, that, that number has gone from 60 to 40 to 30, uh, I, and I look around, I will probably find that, that my quality of life ain't so good anymore because it reflects other things. It reflects um, you know, a, a, a myriad of other things that, that will affect my quality of life as a consumer, as a a player in the economy, uh, don't you think? It, in other words, I, my earlier question I posed, what happens if the reserve currency declines all by itself? But it would never be all by itself. It would be linked with all kinds of other factors, right? That's right. You know, for example, let's suppose you, you and I get to decide for the whole world 
that uh, let's just replace the U.S. dollar as reserve currency, you know, and and let's let's call the new currency the gold o. You know, put an o in the end of gold, just so that it it has some semblance of of history, okay? And we get um, some place that the whole world accepts as wonderful, honest, stable, workable. Let's pretend we pick Switzerland just to pull it out of the air. You know, it's not in the euro. You know, it's not, you know, the U.S. dollar. It's, it's you know, it has, has always been respected for, you know, currency. But if every country in the world says, okay, we will all support gold and so Switzerland could set up like the Fed of New York does. Everybody has their deposits that, you know, back up their pile of gold. You know, and so all the trade transactions happen in gold. You know, so now um, that's unlikely to ever occur. You know, because let's say Canada and the U.S. do enough trade between them. That I mean, I can go to a, a credit union in in you know a little wee town in British Columbia, and uh, and say I'd like to buy some U.S. dollars, and they actually have them in a vault. Bring them out, <laughs> you know. It's it's you know that common that that you need U.S. individuals in Canada take U.S. dollars and use them for generally traveling to the U.S. or traveling anywhere. You know, they do, we don't go to the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve of New York isn't it involved at all. It's just a chartered bank. Um, so that you, you can have transactions that are done otherwise. Like the U.S. would ha have the loss of, of the flexibility they now have with monetary policy be a little tougher to do Janet Yellen's job. She'd call it a lot tougher, but I call it a little bit tougher. Um, you'd have um, <clears throat> the U.S. Congress would have more difficulty running deficits forever or the size of deficits that they now do. Um, the New York money market would not be as big as it now is. You know, it, and so lots of those wealthy people and and vultures would uh, suffer. And, and that uh, means the stock market too, doesn't it? Oh, there would be less money in, well, you really have, why do people invest in the New York Stock Exchange? You know, this is the confidence in the U.S. dollar is part of that, you know, but if you simply, you know, spread out, you know, all countries transacted, did their international financing and international trade in a variety of currencies. You know, the U.S. dollar might still be one of those currencies, just at 20 percent instead of 60 percent. Mm -hmm. um, well, it'll it still have um, what does the US, U.S. Um, New York Stock Exchange constitute, you know, it's just a huge stock market where if you want to invest in Microsoft or or Amazon, you invest there. But if you, you know, if you want to buy, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the big Chinese companies, you know, you usually can buy it on either the London Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange. Well, so much of this has got to do with uh, public confidence, confidence in the future, confidence in the country, confidence in the market, and confidence in the dollar. And I think we have to be very conscious of that in this country right now, because confidence is not like it was. Uh, that's all the time we have, Ken. Thank you so much for this discussion. This really helps to understand you know, where we are and where we might go on reserve currency. Uh, yeah. See you next time soon. All right. I kind of agree with you. I think confidence and prestige are somewhat the same in this problem. Yeah.
or opportunity, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Hello, I can. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.